Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny podcast. This is your host, Stephen Spector. And as usual, I have Rob Hirschfeld. How are you doing, Rob? Stephen, doing very well. Got my cup of coffee. I am settled in and ready to have a great conversation. A uh, cup of coffee in the afternoon. That's super caffeine day. So <laughs> it's been a long, it's been a long, awesome day. So it's, uh, I can, I can understand. Usually I try to have an unhealthy snack in the afternoon for my shit. And this isn't Starbucks coffee, but Starbucks is open this afternoon. Yeah, uh, I, I saw that. Change for, for the week. We have an interesting guest and I'm pleased to bring someone from Boise where I am. You know, we always try to find you interesting and new guests. And I'm really excited about uh, James Ferguson, who's here with us. James is a uh, director of cloud consulting at um, Jumpbox Central, or I think JBC Labs, I think is right. James, can you just uh, give us a little history about yourself before we jump in? Yeah, you bet. Um, so I've, I've been in the tech industry since uh, 92. Started in uh, an ISP world um, doing, when AOL was sending out other 19.95 per month discs to everybody uh, to sign up for America Offline. <laughs> so since then, I um, have, have done quite a bit of things, but um, uh, most recently, Jumpbox Central and JBC Labs are the brands that I, I support. We focus on managed services and uh, software tools for the cloud. Why is Jumpbox Central? I, I, I mean, Jumpbox to me means basically this, you know, a, a system that you jump into in a data center to do utility work and management. Is that, where, where, is that the analogy? Is that the idea? That's correct. Yeah, it, it kind of started as that idea um, to sort of jump in and, and help companies with their tech. You usually had a, a jump box, if you will, that you would jump into and then from there get into their network and be able to help them. And so we, we kind of started the, the theme and the naming off of that. And of course, once we got into the cloud and, you know, things got more interesting, obviously that's a little bit of a, an older term, but still works. That's excellent. Where do you feel like people need help, right? You're doing a lot of Kubernetes. Is Kubernetes a self, you know, clearly you're not, it's not a self-service thing right now. Where, where do people need help with Kubernetes? Yeah. So uh, great question, Rob. So we, uh, we decided that, you know, there, there's several kind of known issues. I wouldn't say necessarily issues, but it's, it's growing and maturing, right? So Kubernetes as a orchestration framework has a lot of great things, a great community around it. They've been able to build quite a good customer base, you know, with um, all three public cloud providers, you know, being now publicly named partners and, uh, and really helping push the envelope there. But that said, you know, it, it, at the end of the day, it is just an orchestration framework and you know, what, what it's sort of lacking still, and there's things that have come out since then, like Helm, Helm charts and other types of ways to sort of help manage what Kubernetes can do and resources it's uh, spinning up inside its clusters. You know, we, we came up with what we call composer, which basically allows you to, to use Kubernetes as your starting point and, and across all three clouds seamlessly, but then you get to define all of your Docker images, your code repositories, et cetera. And so it, it kind of creates that stateless type system where it doesn't matter if it's bare metal or cloud, um, either way you can still use it. And so from our perspective, that was kind of what was lacking in that field. And then also a, a good GUI that people could kind of use. You know, there's a lot of things out there like Terraform or Spinnaker, which allow you to sort of define and create YAML files and things like that. Um, the challenge there, of course, is that unless you're very technical, you know, a, a typical uh, technology team is going to have a tough time sort of spinning those up or learning those quickly. And so it, you know, it, the time to incorporate that internally across your teams becomes longer and, and more challenging. And so uh, we, we tried to sort of short circuit that with, with something that allowed people to sort of have a GUI around it uh, and still use the, the great product that it is. You're talking about the Kubernetes control plane, right? Not applications you build on top. Where, where do you, you know, what, what problem are you trying to solve in that case? We're trying to solve the, the, the problem is that I'm a customer and I'm using Kubernetes. I'll, I'll just give an example of one of our clients who, you know, had a, had a contract with a very large, well-known um, theme park and it spun up for about two months with Kubernetes trying to get it working on AWS alone. And uh, once it got that working and, and kind of stable, uh, the challenge though, was that they were sort of vendor locked a little bit based on the choices they made and sort of along the way. And so we, we try to extract out that problem by saying, okay, 
here's Kubernetes as a base, but you know, all of your stack, everything that you need to have happen inside your nodes and in your networking and everything else that you need, perhaps secured GXP qualified systems or secured uh, IO uh, in your in your stateless systems, you know, can still be done, but uh, through a GUI. So it allows for versioning, it allows for spinning up resources um, at a given moment's notice, and then being able to tear them down as well within a given notice. So QA or UAT can have something up and, and exactly as the developer had it, they can see it exactly as it was when they spun it up and passed it off to QA. QA can then see that and and then, of course, uh, resources are taken down. And so from a cost perspective as well, uh, it takes away the need for somebody to sort of be the governor of that. It allows you to sort of tear it down and, and keep your cost under control. So you're talking about you know, multi-cloud, creating a consistent environment, you know, more elastic. Those make sense. It feels to me there's another piece here where there's a misconception that, that because Kubernetes has all this hype, that it's complete. It sounds to me like you're saying something that, that I hear a bit that, there's a whole bunch of, of things you also have to do to make Kubernetes successful. And can you, you know, just, as, I guess as an illustration point, are, are there, do you have a list of like, oh, and you also needs type of things? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, so a lot of our clients are managed service providers. And to give you a, a, a for instance, uh, based on your question there, the assumption that Kubernetes is complete is, I think, a uh, misnomer and, and a, a little bit misleading. I think uh, I think it's it's good to know that it's there. It's a good technology. It's a good starting place, right? Um, but what it what it's lacking is middleware monitoring support of resources. So, for example, if you have a cluster that you spin up with Kubernetes, and you yourself are not managing that cluster and all of the resources and, and networking that's going on inside of it. Just like uh, with Docker applications, et cetera, or VMs, if the master node and those nodes that you spun up are not managed properly and you're not monitoring them properly, uh, things will just start going away. So if you run out of memory or you run out of uh, disk space, et cetera, things will just start you know, magically disappearing without kind of telling you. And, and so you don't really know what happened unless you go into your logs and kind of check that. And so, so that's been a challenge, I think, for a lot of people using Kubernetes is they don't understand that piece. Um, same thing with Docker was, you know, it's, it's an awesome product. Um, a lot of people can spin things up. They can use uh, GUIs like Kitematic or other types of um, like Mesos, et cetera, et cetera, that help, you know, kind of manage it. But again, you're still stuck to this problem of how do I, how do I know when um, something's going to go offline or it's utilizing resources that aren't available any longer? Uh, and how do I continue to auto scale that or, you know, alert me that something's going wrong. That's one piece. The, the other side is um, from the middleware side of it. You know, Google, for example, just launched Prometheus, um, at least support for that, which I think was great. Um, it allows you to sort of monitor that middleware piece. And that, of course, goes into Stackdriver on their side and, and other, you know, resources. Um, the, the nice thing with that, again, is that um, you know, you're able to sort of monitor the, the quality of the, the products running inside those clusters. The, the other side, though, from a managed services perspective is um, think of a multi-tenant perspective. You've got a, a large enterprise that's running, you know, 15 different verticals. Uh, not only do they need to be able to manage uh, within each vertical, but they also need to see holistically across all 15 verticals you know, what's going on, um, can we route this, you know, application or this state, you know, somewhere else, or do we need to, um, where's the governance of employees spinning things up, you know, at a moment's notice versus, you know, has some controls there. So governance sometimes is lacking as well, uh, as a result of the way it's built. So uh, again, those, those things really help, you know, these larger enterprises understand holistically what's going on across the scope of their environments, not just, you know, that we've got this thing now that can spin this stuff up, which in itself is great. But again, without uh, the ability to manage it properly, it becomes sort of a, a problem. You're having me think about something I hadn't thought about at all, which is Kubernetes sprawl. You might have one team that has five clusters for their life cycle, but you know, they, they could be clusters horizontally across the organization, all different versions, you know, visibility into the fact that I've got, you know, a lot of different Kubernetes clusters running and pipelined and, and you know, having, having that type of information 
as we get more and more Kubernetes in the environment is really important. And then uh, I guess I'm gonna I'm not even gonna bother asking, right? If, if if I let if I went to Google and said Google spin up Kubernetes, Amazon spin up Kubernetes, there's no there, there's an interoperability test that those things are gonna pass, but the amount of control I have from a version perspective and services perspective is pretty minimal. I, I want to drive this into a slightly different direction because there, there's a piece in, in what Kubernetes enables from an ISV opportunity, meaning I'm writing software that provides a generic service, you know, a storage service or a, a, a name lookup service, you know, a database or something that, that I actually want to deploy in Kubernetes and then sell somebody. Is, does that fit into your, your, your map or vision of Kubernetes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think that's, that's kind of the, the sweet spot, if you will, I think for an ISV where, you know, it's, it's sort of like with AMIs or even Docker images for, for to some degree, but less of one um, in, in that, you know, you have a marketplace now within Amazon, you've got one within Google where people can kind of create these custom images with their software licensed, ready to go. You simply purchase the AMI, spin it up, and you've got this ready to go kind of SaaS product within your own cloud environment. Um, I think if you extract that out a little bit broader and say, look, let's not focus on just one particular cloud provider, but let's have some kind of an envelope that allows ISV to be able to um, submit their applications to any cloud at any time, including bare metal, um, have full control of what it looks like at the end of the day from a security standpoint for that customer and the customer as well. And then in, in terms of being able to launch that out, license it, et cetera, you know, it's all sort of pre-done, pre-packaged. So it does take away a lot of the so-called, you know, um, idea that you know you, you sort of lose control or the the visibility of what's happening so it, it does give you a, a better better structure to sort of make that happen across uh, any kind of cloud provider or even on on-prem so i, I want to unpack that a little bit you're describing a kubernetes delivered isv platform so instead of amis and amazon's marketplace there, there's a you know docker hub is, is is not applications it's containers that's correct are you are you envisioning like a, a Kubernetes app store? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you certainly could see it that way. I think Kubernetes is the vehicle, right, that allows you to deploy the things inside it. So um, I, I think it's a little bit misleading to think of Kubernetes in itself as the thing. Kubernetes is really that sort of envelope, if you will, and then inside the envelope is your stack, whatever that is, sewn up the way you need it to be. So. For example, if you're a hospital, uh, perhaps you have qualms about, you know, using the cloud or if you're a utility company, right, in the electricity market or uh, oil and gas, you know, you might have qualms about using the public cloud providers. So what's ways that we can sort of still provide the same type of level of service, auto scaling, et cetera, for our application for these kinds of organizations who need very sophisticated, very controlled environments, um, but still able to um, provide them some kind of relief of their own control of what's going on as well. So I think Kubernetes is a great vehicle for that. And in, in many ways, it allows for the, sort of that stateless idea. Okay, I, I want to get to stateless in a minute, but I want to dig on this ISV thing for a minute because there's I'm still there's still a missing piece to me. Okay. You know, if I'm a, if I'm a hospital and I wrote software, deploying with Kubernetes makes all the sense in the world, right? So I'm, I'm but hospitals don't write software necessarily. They're, they're, they want to they're going to buy software and if so so they go out they go to hospital supply software supply company they come up with a clever acronym like anyway, I'm not going to on the fly uh, and this hospital software supply company says install kubernetes here's our application we're going to license it to you but that application is not going to be complete it's it's going to be missing the you know, software to run the backup generators in this the market exists for somebody to sell that missing piece of software into that Kubernetes cluster for the hospital to run their that one vendor's software, right? Multi-vendor integrated uh, platform. That's that's what I'm. That's but to me, that's the holy grail. Is is yeah, how this, Kubernetes become that? Yeah, I to answer your question, no, I don't. I don't believe there is a, a marketplace as of now. I think there's a community out there. Um, there's certainly a lot of articles and, and people talking about things, right? Slack channels, et cetera. So 
uh, certainly resources to sort of help find some of those things. But in terms of having a kind of conjoined, you know, marketplace, if you will, uh, that that would be incorrect. I don't I don't think there is anything like that. But certainly, I agree with your assessment there that I think that is sort of the holy grail. Um, and certainly, it provides for. We did have a marketplace that provided that. I think uh, you'd see a lot of organizations realize the power behind what they can do with it. Kubernetes still is a long ways off from being sort of accepted. I know function as a service is becoming the hot topic currently, of course. And so a lot of people are convinced all of a sudden that, you know, that's the future. Kubernetes still has has a ways to go in terms of uh, saturation in the marketplace. So Ser- serverless and, and function as a service definitely lives up to the latest shiny tag of excellence as far as, you know, everybody wanting to jump on. Why, why do you think people are so excited about function as a service as the, the way to go? What makes it the right answer? I think they're excited from the perspective that extracts away from having the idea of having a lot of developers or a lot of resources like servers, for example, running a lot of things for you, right? So if you're using something uh, on-prem like iron.io, or you're using something in the cloud like Lambda or any of the other function as a service providers out there in the cloud, you know, at the end of the day, you still have to have code that's written to sort of make them work, but uh, it does allow you to do things a lot more quickly. Uh, You don't have to have five developers working on one application, whether it's agile or waterfall or even lean, it it doesn't, you know, just doesn't require that anymore. It's more of a, look, here's the one thing I need to have happen at this specific time, you know, and here's my, my tags and my uh, my calls for that, and then you know it sort of does it for you, which is which is great. But again, I think the the missing piece there is from an enterprise perspective. There's there's certainly um, ways that that FOS or function as a service work really well, um, but I think they're still lacking sort of this fundamental idea of you know knowing that okay now that we've extracted out all of these different things into 1,500 different processes, which are basically called Boz, uh, right. we, we still have to manage those, right? So, uh, so, so you've kind of replaced one headache with another, which is okay. Now that we've got these fifteen hundred single one-off calls, how am I managing that? And so that that has still not been answered. And I think uh, even though it's shiny and it's new, and I, I know a lot of app developers love it, uh, using the cloud product like Lambda definitely has its advantages uh, for speed and expediency. But uh, you know, from an er- enterprise perspective, I think it still has a ways to go. And, I mean, and that's that's been our experience. We use it, but there's zero portability. The, the events that you use in one of those uh, function as a service platforms is totally different, right? The formats are different. There's no code portability. You're talking about observability and operate in the system operations. I, I'm not even sure if I wrote for one platform if I could pick up that code and move it anywhere else. Yeah, that's that's correct. Yeah, and I think I think that's where. Companies like Iron.io and, and there's a GitHub, you know, open source FOS project going that has a lot of community involvement. I think right. those are, are good steps going towards something that's a little bit more compatible across the board. But to, to your point, uh, right now there is there's nothing really available out there that sort of makes it work, you know, regardless of which one it's on. And I know the CNCF is, sp- is spinning up a, uh, a working group or a, I don't know how what what categories they've chartered it as, but they're actually trying to create some standards, and there's a ton, but there's a ton of these things, right? Open Whisk is one of the ones that I've, I, I track in communities. I hadn't heard IO for a while, but they're they're definitely an option. I think there's uh, Platform Nine has has one that they vision. I think plus the individual cloud providers all have their own function as a service. That feels like very early frothy market when you've got that many sort of alternatives coming up with our you know, architectural differences and changes does that give you pause in having people adopt yeah i mean i i think i think it does especially from a vendor lock perspective right i think the biggest concern a lot of cios have and ctos for that matter is you know why it's great that we're going to use amazon or we're going to use azure or you know or gcp or one of the many others ibm etc but the question is how do I sort of extract from that if, if we decide tomorrow that we need to leave, you know, a particular platform because either pricing increased, it sort of removes the democratization of your costs if you're sort of vendor locked in. And so, um, so I think those concerns are very real 
And I think until those are sort of answered, I, I think uh, function as a service will be a, a hit point for many DevOps guys, but from a uh, application or a, a business side of things, I think uh, that this still has a ways to go. Do you see function as a service as like a Kubernetes app or a workload that you would include into your, your catalog? Uh, I, it, I mean, this it, not in the, in the Nirvana case I was talking about, but just from a, hey, if we're going to spin somebody up a Kubernetes cluster, here's a function as a service application that you can we'll put in there for you. I do for sure. I think, I think it has a lot of great aspects in terms of, you know, if you need uh, something to happen at a specific time or you've got an ETL process that needs to kick off, for example, or you, you've got uh, analytics, for example, like Logstash, et cetera, that you need to have happen, maybe FOS is a good, you know, way of sort of do that as well. So, Is this a peanut butter and chocolate type combination where... If you're doing, doing Kubernetes, you're, you're almost certainly going to put a uh, function as a service platform with it and then start using it, and that will just become our normal mode of operations? Eventually, uh, that will be the case. I, I, I don't think necessarily that that's, that's out of the box what people are focused on. I think, I think uh, the two are very different in, in what they're doing. I think a lot of app providers and enterprises and SMBs out there right now already have sort of their own idea of, of what functions need to happen, Chrome jobs, et cetera. They're fine with those and they, they work fine for them. So they, they sort of see function as a service as something to, to come second to that, not necessarily hand in hand. As it continues to mature and, and get you know more marketplace adoption and you're able to use it uh, more portable, uh, you know, across, uh, whether it's all three cloud providers or even across your own stacks, then it becomes uh, more tenable from a business perspective. I think right now it's, it's a nice to have, you know, if you're using Amazon web services, for example, and you want to create a full uh, CDN process, you know, FOS is great for that, you know, serverless approach, right? Um, if you're, if you're looking to do ETL, that's great for that as well. But if you're looking at, you know, multiple, you know, vertical departments running things and, and, um, you've got to kind of control all of those, you know, then it, it gets a little messy pretty quick. So again, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's still got a ways to go and maturity is still not attained yet. I mean, I could see in, in what you're describing from the Kubernetes perspective in, that's portable and hybrid is, you know, function as a service is part of your service mesh definition, right? I've got my application running in containers, happily service mesh. There's, there's something I need to do and transform and extract. Right. Thank you. Yeah. I can see using, uh, you know, Lambda, you know, or Kubernetes, you know, Kubernetes function, however we want to describe it as a, as a extract transform load ETL into the system as part of that mesh where do you, you know, does istio or some other service mesh play a, a critical role in in stitching all this together oh for sure yeah absolutely i mean i i think i think you you have to you have to have something to sort of bind it together right not to not to be corny with lord of the rings analogies but you know you still have to have the ring that rules it all it all you know and so i think in in many ways you you see advantages of utilizing these one off approaches or a particular use case um, definitely comes into play but when you're looking at uh, how do we do this seamlessly across the board with visibility qa uat production systems, you know, then you still need something to sort of kind of bind it together and, and be able to use that as its own object of, you know, resource and visibility into everything that's happening. Uh, without that, it, it becomes sort of, uh, you know, just a secondary noise application within that space and, and unfortunately becomes a, a bit of a headache, you know, from a uh, just a scaling perspective later. Is DO or service mesh part of the offering that you've been putting together? Do you do you think it's a you know even without looking at it from a commercial perspective, is it is it becoming a requirement from a Kubernetes deployment perspective? Yes, yeah, for sure, absolutely. Okay, so if somebody is looking at doing Kubernetes, this is one of those out of not included in the box types of things. You're you're saying I'm deploying Kubernetes. Yay, I got something running in Kubernetes. Pat a big pat on the back. Oh, I better start learning about service mesh next? Absolutely. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, the pat on the back is great, but again, like anything, utilizing the technology without understanding why 
is, is problematic for anyone. And, you know, like anything in tech, whatever the new shiny thing is, you know, a lot of people get uh, really excited about it and become fanboys, you know, overnight and, and want to do it, which is great. But again, without understanding implementation and also the uh, implications to your organization from a business perspective and, you know, how are those things sort of managed, you know, then, then it becomes a problem. So, you know, having a full visible roadmap strategic initiative within your organization to say, okay, you know, we're going to use Kubernetes for our, our node composition and clusters and, you know, sort of managing what's going on in, in each, but we still need that, that mesh that then says, okay, this service is doing X, this one's doing X, uh, and then getting some visible porting into that as well. You know, those are still required. Um, without that, you know, you've, you've basically just, you know, kind of deployed another thing that, uh, you know, just adds more noise to your application. So how do you, how do you make a service mesh easier to use? Is there, is, is, or is that this is something we're still working through the learning curve on? Going through the learning curve, honestly, I, I think I think there's uh, there's been some good enhancements in that. The service mesh, you know, again, I think um, coming up with a plan, it's it kind of reminds me of going back to uh, relational database structures in some regards, and maybe that's a bad example, but the point being that you know, without a good plan in place up front, you know, naming conventions, you know, what are we going to call these things? Um, how do they talk to each other? Why are we having them talk to this particular service? space and, and not this one without that sort of plan in place up front i think there's a lot of opportunity for collisions and you know in bad practices so again i think the service mesh comes into play that you, you need to define those things in advance or at least understand where you're going with it before you do it versus after because once it's up and, and going uh, you're going to have to do a lot of uh, retro kind of fixes to your environments to, to sort of make it work and this this is, I think, a nice full circle sort of for the discussion because Kubernetes by itself is a really great, interesting technology with a lot of hype and excitement for good reason. But it's not that hard to get to the edge of that space and say, well, wait a second, function as a service is a really important addition that accomplishes something that you need done. Service mesh is an important addition. It's something you need done. Right, and then you, know, you added a whole bunch of extra bits and pieces, right, that that need to get there. And then I I, sh I show up with with you know with my holy grail and <laughs> describe a marketplace. And I, I I think you're answering one of my implicit questions, which is always what's keeping us from from having ISB marketplace on Kubernetes. And, and we just basically spent you know 35 minutes talking through real gaps, you know, involving stuff, but real gaps. Is there, is there something right? Or is that a fair sort of summary? Yeah, absolutely. I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I think, um, you know, I think like with anything, you know, I think uh, nobody's at the Holy grail of technology, right? I think each thing that we add on, I, you know, I've been in this space since 92, like I said earlier, and the challenge always isn't, you know, what the next new thing is. It's, you know, what does that next new thing need? to sort of help close the gap and what are the holes that are missing with it, right? And, and so uh, certainly a lot of things have been answered with sort of the new um, hyperscale approach with cloud and uh, a lot of even, you know, on-prem uh, approaches. But uh, I think uh, without, without answering fully, you know, those holes in advance, I think you can get yourself into trouble real quick, just like with anything. So again, knowing what those are and, and sort of as you state, having a marketplace, I think certainly would help kind of close the gap and, and get people more focused on what are the what are, are the gaps and what are the holes still, you know, here and what are we missing? What what helps kind of alleviate these problems? James, this is uh, C Spectre again. And I, um, as, as Rob says, I give him the evil stink eye or the evil eye, whatever it is. But as the official timekeeper of the podcast, I have to jump in. It's been a great discussion, but uh, we're running out of time. I wanted to give you a chance to, you know, offer for our listeners some places where they can get in touch with you, learn more about your company, any of that kind of uh, information. Yeah, certainly. Uh, they can feel free to come to jbclabs.com or jumpboxcentral.com. Both will go to the same location, which is our, our primary website. i more than happy to, to talk with anyone. My email address is james at jumpboxcentral.com. 
and look forward to uh, further discussions. Great. Well, James, thanks again for uh, participating in the podcast this week. And, uh, and we look forward to uh, future conversations again. Uh, and thanks, Rob, as well, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you both. It's a great conversation. Thanks, guys.